This is the American Law Journal. Every four years we say this presidential election could have a dramatic impact on the Supreme Court and your rights. Well, guess what? This year, we're right. Good evening. Welcome to the program. I'm Christopher Naughton. We are at a tipping point with this current U.S. Supreme Court. And based on this election cycle, something is going to give. Gina Passarella explains. I think it's a highly respected institution. It was when I came, and I, I don't think I've destroyed it. Uh, so I'd say it's one of the most respected institutions in, in American life. The late Antonin Scalia on the legacy of the Supreme Court. In death, as in life, Scalia casts a huge shadow on the court. The next president will almost certainly have at least one appointment, which means that you will, in effect, determine the balance of the court for what could be the next quarter century. With Scalia's passing last February, the stakes are as high as they have ever been. And the reason this is so monumental is that right now, with the eight justices on the Supreme Court, you know, it's not perfect this way, but for the most part, we've got four conservatives and four liberals. So with the ninth seat, so this will really control or change the balance of power for a long time. And with the Senate refusing to even consider Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland, this is the longest time a seat has remained vacant in the court's history. Some are saying they won't appoint a ninth Supreme Court justice at all. Democrats have rejected justices, Republicans have. I'm okay with that. But to simply say, we're not going to hold a vote, we're going to wait for almost a year or over a year for the next president, that's wrong. It has never happened before. And so as much as I personally disagree with what they're doing, they completely understand the stakes here and are doing everything they can to make sure that the Supreme Court does not become liberal. But filling that vacancy left by Scalia is becoming more critical. Before his February death, studies were showing that the contemporary court was the most polarized in history, with a higher percentage of five to four rulings under Chief Justice Roberts than any, under any other previous chief justice. Meaning one vote on the court could affect landmark decisions on voting rights, immigration, Obamacare, consumer protection, and the notorious Citizens United case. You know, I think when we talk about the Supreme Court, it really raises the central issue in this election. The Supreme Court needs to stand on the side of the American people, not on the side of the powerful corporations and the wealthy. It's just so imperative that we have the right justices. They will interpret the Constitution the way the founders wanted it interpreted. If Donald Trump wins and he says he would like to appoint a justice in the Justice Scalia mold, if we have another Justice Scalia, but younger, then it would be a continuation of the Roberts Court and everything that it's done in a conservative way. If we were to get a liberal on the court, I don't know if we'd go so far as how liberal the Warren Court was in the 50s and 60s, but I mean, all of these big ticket issues that we've seen a conservative trend for the past 20, 30 years, that could be reversed with a liberal court. In this political season, there are no guarantees. But one would expect that after the election, that all-important ninth member of the Supreme Court will finally be confirmed. But depending on who wins, that could mean a continuation of the most conservative court we've seen in decades, or the formation of the most liberal bench we've seen in a generation. For the American Law Journal, I'm Gina Passarella. All right, four guests with me tonight, two here in the studio, two from afar. Let's go ahead and meet them. Howard Bashman, a renowned appellate attorney in both state and federal matters. He is the author of the widely read How Appealing blog from CNN Washington tonight. Kristen Clark joins us. She is the president and executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. Ilya Shapiro joins us via Skype tonight. He is with the Cato Institute and, in fact, is the editor of Cato's Supreme Court Review. And Professor John Culhane is the H. Albert Young Fellow in Constitutional Law at Widener University, Delaware Law School. Take a look at this recent Washington Post headline, and here it is. The Supreme Court at a crossroad November election could shape ideological balance for decades. John, this really is the perfect storm. Well, it really is. I mean, you've got a court that's shorthanded, right? You've got eight justices, and the uh, next Supreme Court uh, justices will be appointed by either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. They'll probably get to make several appointments. So, so even from the perspective of numbers, it's significant. And then when you look at the dysfunction and the polarization that you have in Congress, 
which I think is sure to continue, then the court's role becomes even more important because the court's going to be called on to resolve matters that usually would be left to the other two branches of government. Yeah. I, I would say let's not forget about the current nominee, Merrick Garland, because it is possible if the Senate turns over to Democratic control that, that the current Senate could still confirm Judge Garland to the Supreme Court. That's if Obama year. does not pull that nomination. Now, I think I've heard him say he was not going to pull that nomination. Uh, Kristen, maybe you can weigh in here. Have you heard that Obama will continue to keep, uh, you know, Merrick Garland out there, if you will, uh, as a nominee uh, after this election, let's say, if Hillary Clinton wins? Everything that I've heard from the president makes clear that he stands by his choice for the vacancy on the Supreme Court. He was very deliberative in making his selection and uh, has picked somebody who has bipartisan support on both sides of the aisle. Uh, he's picked somebody who has served at the helm of the nation's most important circuit court. The D.C. Circuit Court is held in high regard. So he's picked a really qualified nominee. I don't see him reversing course at this stage. I think that it is unfortunate that the Supreme Court vacancy has become an intensely politicized issue. We have Republicans in the Senate who've dug their heels in the ground and refused to give Garland any consideration uh, regardless. Uh, and I think that that's unfortunate. And so they've uh, I think made this a political issue in a way that threatens the integrity of our nation's highest court in the land. Ilya, would you say that this has been a dereliction of duty? Some would say it's been a, you know, a robust political move. Dereliction of duty? No, not at all. All the Constitution says is that the Senate gives its advice and consent, and they advise President Obama that they are going to wait until the election, uh, given uh, how polarized the nation is and re-electing President Obama in 2012 and then giving the Republicans the Senate in 2014. We're essentially in an unprecedented situation. In, the, in modern times, for uh, a vacancy to arise during a presidential election year with split government and uh, to boot the court being split evenly and uh, the vacancy caused by the death of uh, one of the lions uh, uh, of the Supreme Court, um, I mean, this is a political argument any way you slice it. The Republicans in the Senate uh, did draw their line in the sand, and it's actually remarkable that they've held to it. Uh, you can lose a lot of money trying to bet on the spine and the, the steel and the spine of uh, Republican senators, but uh, it's not hurting them in the polls. Yeah, so I think it's possible to argue this, you know, either way in terms of the politics of it. And I think, uh, you know, you could say, on the other hand, what's unprecedented is the sheer number of days that this vacancy has gone unfilled. In July, we broke the record. But I think there's a more important issue here than the constitutional issue, because obviously there's nothing in the Constitution that makes the Senate do this. But just in terms of a well-functioning democracy, I think there's something really, you know, really upsetting and concerning when uh, one branch of government says, we're not going to do what has always been done in the past. And yeah, you can say it's unprecedented, but uh, the fact is, Unfortunately for the right, you know, Justice Scalia died, you know, early in the year. There's plenty of time left, and it's the job of the president to uh, pick someone. It's insane for the court to be, be operating with eight justices. This has been an absolute dereliction of duty um, to not even hold a hearing and give the American public an opportunity to hear from and learn what kind of jurist Garland might be reflects complete disregard for the Constitution. And couldn't this actually backfire on the Republicans? It, it absolutely could backfire on the Republicans. Uh, at, at the same time, I think that Republicans, when they hear the current Democratic protests, might just have a two-word answer, which is Miguel Estrada. The, the Democrats, when they controlled the Congress and there was a Republican president, refused to give a vote to this D.C. Circuit nominee because they were concerned that maybe he would become the first Hispanic justice and be very conservative. And, uh, and so who, who cast the first stone in this battle is something we could argue over all night. Uh, but but I, I do think that the situation we're in now is not a good one. When Justice Alito came up for confirmation, the Democrats, you know, pretty much held their powder, held their fire. They, they were actually fairly reasonable about it. I don't think that that happens now, given what's happened that, here in the last year. That's not true. 25 of them, including President Obama and Hillary Clinton, voted to filibuster. Justice Alito.
Yeah, uh, truly. Yeah, but that's he got I mean, a hearing. He did get a hearing, and it was only well, tw it was well, only twenty five, right? This is a ratcheting up. Uh, it's both parties do it. It's a very political exercise because these things matter, and there are different views of the proper judicial role. It's it's properly a matter for politics because the Supreme Court, over decades, has gone so far away from constitutional law. And frankly, not having hearings, I think, is more of a clean, honorable thing to do rather than having some sort of kabuki Potemkin hearings and then voting the person down anyway. It's not about Garland. So you would say that if the situation was reversed, we had a Republican president and a Democratic uh, Congress, that if the Democrats had wanted to say, let's wait until the presidential election, you would be fine with that? Well, who cares what I have to say? Joe Biden <laughs> said that in 1992. All right. uh, Chuck Schumer, Did... Harry Reid said uh -huh. that in previous years and last years of Republican presidential terms. Look, let's not be naive about this. This is all about a high stakes uh, political warfare, and it's up to the voters to uh, reward or punish. But, John Klein. Yeah. So. You know what Biden said and what he did are are two different things. But I guess, I guess the bigger point that I'm concerned about is, as you're saying, the idea of ratcheting this up is already continuing. John McCain said that we would oppose uh, basically any nominee that a President Clinton would put forward, and that's what it's come to. So. You can talk about, well, you can, you know, maybe justify this, but uh, what really is going on is this idea of, you know, pure obstruction, and it's not going to go away no matter who the president is, and my deeper concern uh, is with the process breaking down, and the idea that you would simply ignore a candidate that's sitting there, and I didn't like it when it happened with Estrada either. I thought there should have, you know, should have been hearings. And. Uh Going back to one of your points, uh, Mer Merrick Garland was certainly one of the more, one of the less Sessions. objectionable nominees According that, that Hatch, uh, President right. Obama could have right. come right. up with. Right. Uh, not, not solely just because of the fact that he's viewed as rather moderate, but also his age, if I have it correct, is 64. That would make him just the fourth youngest justice on the court as opposed to coming in as the youngest, which right. tends to be what the newest person does. Yes, of course. And, uh, and so his, his overall tenure on the court would be perhaps smaller as a result. But let's be clear, we're in the dark ages here. This is an unprecedented moment that we are in. Every other presidential nominee virtually has had their nominee uh, receive consideration by the Senate. And we're now into a second term of the Supreme Court, which has only eight justices in place to decide some of the most important cases that come before it every term. I had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal in February, soon after Justice Scalia's death, talking about the modern court since the Second World War. And it gets through it in all sorts of ways. Uh, it, it turns out that the, an eight justice or even sometimes a seven justice court uh, is not really handicapped. Roe v. Wade, for example, was held over until there was a full complement of justices. They didn't hold, held, hold over any cases this past term. The immigration, the biggest issue that our country has wrestled with, that case ended in a 4-4 tie last term. So I, I disagree with the premise. Some people have been applauding the new minimalist Supreme Court, huh. which is uh, not perhaps getting as involved in the most difficult questions as it had in the past. And, and also, it further does emphasize the importance of lower court judges when, when the Supreme Court is evenly divided, because then the lower courts will oftentimes have the last word in many of these most difficult cases. And even though the Fifth Circuit, which is the federal appellate court that the immigration case came out of, decided that against the Obama administration, the, the Obama administration has put many federal appellate judges on onto the different U.S. courts of appeals, and, and many of them now are dominated by Democrats as opposed to in But aren't there years. still 100 vacancies? Yeah. Well, that, that's that's true, and that's a problem. <laughs> and and there's this other issue about Almost how, left that out, Howard. <laughs> how in the last year of a president, th those vacancies don't tend to get filled either traditionally. Mm -hmm. Right. So I've been a bit, you think there's been a bit of stonewalling there in the federal well, judiciary. especially recently, right? Okay. And we can, again, we can argue about, you know, about precedent, but the idea, I mean, I think there's a deeper, this will be a whole different show, but there's a deeper kind of disrespect for this president that you can see in a number of different areas. And when it comes to the court appointments, I think this is, you know, this is a prime example. But, you know, I'm concerned, my bigger concern here is that this kind of a uh, toxic view of what the Senate should and shouldn't do is not going to go away 
when the election happens. And we've already seen that, as I mentioned, with what Senator McCain said. So I think we're going to be in a situation where when you have a split in government, there's going to be this reluctance to confirm Supreme Court justices. And I think, yeah, you can say, well, you can do a workaround. There were only a certain number of decisions that went four to four. But those arguments just sound silly on their face to me. We should have a full complement. We need an, we need an odd number of justices. As my 12-year-olds pointed out in the car yesterday on the way back from the beach, I said, what's the problem with having eight justices? And they said, well, you could have a tie. <laughs> and I said, I, I don't even need to be on a, you know, on a show to talk about this. Right. Everybody <laughs> understands that. Out of the mouth right? of the base. Jones, That's but actually not a completely obvious point. There are Supreme Courts in the world that have an even number, and that's to ensure that any decisions that are taken aren't simply a narrow, uh, you know, five to four or four to three uh, decision. There are sometimes, for, in, in different countries, for different types of cases, sometimes you need a two-thirds majority of the court to resolve certain issues. In our own country's history, the number of uh, justices on the Supreme Court has vacillated from six to ten and finally settled upon nine. So it's, it's not necessarily a magic number. I'm surprised you would you would cite number. international nine's sources. Nine is a but good number. <laughs> nine is a good number. Let's talk about the reality of circuit courts around our country that come out different ways on critically important issues. The Supreme Court is the court that helps to provide clar clarity for judges across our country in district courts and circuit courts that look to the Supreme Court for guidance. So this suggestion that the Supreme Court just sit back and, and be a passive player while the law plays out in varied ways across our country, I think is, is anti-democratic and, and not a view of how our, our system works uh, today. And I know when Chief Justice Roberts stepped up and, and basically when he was nominated and stepped into the Chief Justice position, he said he wanted to have consensus opinions, the largest majorities, super majorities, if not unanimous decisions. Of course, that rarely happens in our history, and especially not now. Yeah, it's not surprising at all. Uh, we are in a polarized country. The federal government has taken upon itself so much power now that even though we have many different views in this large pluralistic society, uh, the federal government tries to impose one-size-fits-all solutions. And we have parties that are more ideologically coherent than at any time uh, in history. So you're gonna have these intractable splits, but even so, the rate of five to four splits, despite what you might uh, think just by looking at front pages, is only about 20 or 25 percent of cases. That's a lot, but still, half the cases the are highest, decided Elliot's, unanimously. Elliot's the highest in history, and that's what I think Joan Biskupic's sure. point was. Sure. So, and, and again, and, and they have held off dealing with some of these really important cases because I think they're fearful they're not going to have that fifth vote. John Cullen. Well, just basically, you know, it's, it's uh, 20, 25 percent. It completely matters what cases those are, right? So some of the cases are unanimous. Nobody thinks they're going to go any other way. Sometimes, you know, uh, the Supreme Court is just basically throwing out a ruling from a lower court that doesn't make any sense or is a misreading of the statute. Uh, so, of course, it's going to be a small percentage, but those tend to be the most important cases. I think that's a point worth making. And if uh, Hillary Clinton is elected president, and given the fact that three justices now are either over or nearing the age of 80, it, it could soon be the situation that Chief Justice Roberts' view of what should be happening could be rendered essentially irrelevant, because he'll, he'll be in the minority in most cases, and, and how the court should come out will be controlled by the remaining justices. I think it'll be the first time in a generation where the Chief Justice is not on a court that, is, that, that largely shares his views. True. That is, it's true. And, and, and that's, and that's that's why a lot of people say there's a lot at stake here, because if Donald Trump is elected, he says he wants a Scalia type uh, and perhaps a young Scalia type as well. Uh, Alito was, what, 48 when he was uh, put up on the bench. So if you get a young Scalia type, that probably brings the court down the road of, of something even more conservative than we have seen here in the last 10 or 15 years. If Hillary Clinton wins, and it's not Merrick Garland who ends up getting that slot, it's someone more liberal. Now the power base of this court has shifted. So say someone, well, let's say for a moment that it is Garland who gets that slot. What is then the center of this court? It's no longer the decider, Justice Kennedy. He's no longer the decider. Who's the decider at this point? Is it Elena Kagan? Howard I, I think that Justice Breyer is probably more conservative than Elena Kagan, and so Some it might, it might put right. him 
into that uh, position, perhaps, right. or, or perhaps Garland himself from the yeah. get-go. Interesting. He might he might be in that position. Kristen or Ilya, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I think that I think that's right. That Garland may indeed fall in the center of the court. I mean, he definitely was a moderate uh, choice on the part of the president. Somebody with support on both sides of the aisle. Somebody who was a consensus builder uh, during his time in the D.C. Circuit. So I think that's right. But what's most important to remember here is. We're talking about cases involving the death penalty, cases that could come before the court concerning election law issues for this election cycle, uh, reproductive rights, immigration. We have a court that is in a state of paralysis, and we need to take the politics out of the nomination process so this court can do its job and provide clarity uh, for the country on such critically important issues. Kristen Clark, we want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Kristen, again, the executive director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights under the law, headquartered in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for joining us, Kristen. I dare say we'll be seeing you again. Thank you. Take care. Have a good evening. So everyone gets a chance to pick a case or two that you think that this Supreme Court is going to hear in this new term. And again, no blockbusters yet. We're not going to see Obamacare. We're not going to see something likely on immigration. What, what, what's turning you guys on as far as cases before the Supremes this year? And Ilya will get you in here as well. Howard, what, what's, what's, what, what should we the be one, paying attention to? The one that they've granted so far very recently is a case called uh, Ashcroft versus Turkmen, which involves claims by 9-11 detainees against uh, federal government officials. And, uh, and it's a case that finally has reached the U.S. Supreme Court. The Second Circuit allowed the lawsuit to go forward. The U.S. Supreme Court's going to determine if these government officials have qualified immunity and some other issues related to that. Uh, interestingly, there, there will not be eight justices deciding that case. There will only be six right now because both Elena Kagan and Sonia Sotomayor are, are recused. So it'll take four to decide that case. Wow. But, but, but two of the so-called liberals on the court will not be making that decision. John. Yeah, so I'm looking at a transgender rights case, and uh, the issue there is whether a person who identifies uh, or, or whether the sex of, of identification controls or whether it's the uh, birth sex and, and basically who gets to decide that, right? And the lower court, I, I could get into the nuances, but the lower court essentially said that this is really a sort of up to the person, right, to make that decision about their identity and it must be respected. The Obama administration is standing uh, with the kid under Title IX. And of course, the response of the school district is, we think we're being reasonable, we're offering a segregated bathroom, uh, and uh, we should have the ability to make that decision. Mm -hmm. So I think that could be a blockbuster case. There's a case where if you had a 4-4 split and the court is in its, in its current configuration, then the lower court opinion out of the Fourth Circuit, which says the kid gets to decide is what right. would control. There you go. Ilya, what's uh, turning you on in the new term? The case that's interesting to me uh, is the uh, trademark dispute about disparaging trademarks. Lee uh, versus Cam, right. the slants case with the yeah. uh, Asian American rock group that, that wants to take back the term slants. And this actually has a relationship to the Washington Redskins, who recently yeah. uh, there was a ruling that deregistered their trademark. So is that part of the trade of the of the Lanham Act, the trademark yeah. uh, act, you know, constitutional? One of the issues being, of course, they are Asian American. They want to call themselves slants, but they say if we change the Lanham Act, all of a sudden you could have you know, uh, someone uh, using a pejorative that is not a member of that race or that class. Uh, you know, a, a white punk band calling themselves the N-word or something along those lines. Yeah. But depending on what happens with this court and whether we have a President Clinton or Trump, it could impact cases in the not too distant future, such as a Citizens United case, such as a Shelby County voting rights case, uh, issues of living in a post-racial America, gerrymandering, workplace fairness, corporate influence, class actions. Now, again, those may not be on the docket this term, but you sure as heck got to expect it may be the following term, don't you? I, I think so. In the, future, in the future, that's where all the action is. And this was brought up before, the lower courts. Uh, the Supreme Court, even re re forget Merrick Garland or our current controversy, over the last 20 years has been on a decline in the number of cases that it's deciding. Currently, it's about 65 to 75. 25 years ago, it was double that. Uh, and so 35,000 cases are decided by the lower courts, and every four years, a presidential term, a president replaces about a fifth of that number. That's a huge change, uh, and that's where most people uh, get their legal rulings. 
So Howard, we've we've raised this in the past, and uh, and it and it does bear repeating that that we have kind of, and maybe it's pretty sad we've we've entered into an age of ideological purity. So there was a time where liberal presidents would pick conservative justices. I think of JFK picking uh, Byron Wizard right. White, who actually voted against Roe versus Wade. You have conservative presidents like Eisenhower nominating William Brennan. You have Gerald Ford tapping John Paul Stevens. You had George H. W. Bush picking, you know, David Souter, especially in light of what's gone on here in the last year. Those years are gone and behind us, aren't they? Or at least from this perspective. I, I think that's absolutely true. And and the idea of a justice, potential justice being unpredictable is something that these vetting processes are intended to entirely eliminate. And uh, the, the Republicans were more critical of their presidents nominating unpredictable justices than I think the Democrats were because with the exception of Justice White, I'm not sure you can cite ma many others, uh, but, but with Roberts and Alito, the Republicans have hit the target they were aiming for. And, and I think that that shows that, that both sides are paying much closer attention to that. Well, I think something that all of us may agree with Hillary Clinton on tonight, I bet you even we get Ilya to, to uh, agree with us on this one, is that she said recently, so think hard about the Supreme Court. For years, people have tried to make the court a voting issue, and it's not an easy thing to do. Ilya, if we can't make it an important issue this year, when can we? No, it, it never would be, except, as I said before, if not for the Trump tornado uh, upending this entire uh, race, I think we would uh, have been talking about the Supreme Court it didn't come a, a up, whole lot more. It didn't come up much when Romney ran against Obama. It didn't come up much when McCain ran against Obama, and you'd think it well, would right. have. That's, there, wasn't a, there wasn't a historic vacancy during an election year. Too I mean, this bad. is a, uh, you know, the perfect storm as you began the program. By right. Okay. I'll stipulate to that. <laughs> Last thoughts, Howard? Uh, you know, I, th I think that the way both candidates have treated the Supreme Court is interesting in that, pres in that uh, Clinton is saying that uh, she would appoint justices to overrule Citizens United, and uh, Trump has come up with a name of 20 or 21 possible nominees. I mean, I think that those are both unheard of. Uh, w whether either one can be trusted to stick with their announced plan remains to be seen. And John, final words. Well, so the court is, is extremely politicized, and I guess the only other point I'd make is we were talking about this earlier uh, in the green room, is I kind of wish that the justices would sometimes sort of shut up in public because they, they talk a lot about their positions. And that seems to me, I could be wrong about this, but it seems to me to be kind of a recent phenomenon. And I think this is a bipartisan indictment. Justice Scalia was well known for doing this. Uh, Justice Ginsburg has been uh, talking a lot uh, about her views. And I think you know, whether it's, it's gay marriage or whether it's what the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment means and how it's intended, I think it's better if they avoid further politicizing the court, uh, which is already plenty politicized. Something else I think we can uh, agree on. I want to thank my guest tonight, Howard Bashman, again, renowned appellate attorney in state and federal cases, the author of the How Appealing blog. Ilya Shapiro joining us tonight via Skype, senior fellow with Constitutional Studies at Cato and the editor-in-chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. And John Colhane, who really deserves the award tonight because every member of your household was actually celebrating a birthday tonight. Except me. Except you. <laughs> right. And you chose to be here. John Colhane, H. Albert Young Fellow in Constitutional Law at Widener University, Delaware Law School. For all of us here at ALJ, thanks for joining us this week. Until next Monday night, case closed. This week's American Law Journal is made possible in part by Law Catalyst, video and film production for the legal profession. Go to lawcatalyst.com. Swartz Cullenton PC, a personal injury law firm that concentrates on safeguarding the wounded. Get the justice you deserve. Blank Rome, providing strategic advice for employers in today's workplace. Beatty, Sloan, and DeGenova, providing consumer protection in injury matters for over 30 years. And The Legal Intelligencer, an American lawyer media publication and the oldest law journal in the United States.